Well, um, I wanted to do something in English uh, this Saturday. I do a daily Spanish brief radio show, as I've said. And I basically did an eight-part uh, introduction to Christianity, ending supposedly uh, with ethics, spirituality, the saints, and holiness. I don't think I spoke too much about the saints or prayer, for example. Uh, and so I think this is going to be number nine to sort of maintain a little continuity with that. But I am going to try to be much more personal and um, conversational even though I think I've been uh, a little bit like that anyway, and sort of speak about my personal experience uh, in the spiritual life, etc. I may have already said some of these things before. I, I tend to forget uh, recent things. But in any case, um, as I... I'm sure I did say I had an experience of God in Cuba before a large uh, crucifix, bloody, typical Spanish Christ on the cross. When I ventured into a sacristy or some other sort of mysterious place for a very young boy, four or five years old, I think, and that stayed with me, and I think I did speak about how I turned to prayer as a youth and had a conversion uh, at um, 19, entered the Dominicans in Mexico, and received a very good theological and spiritual foundation with great uh, men that I lived with and heard and, and met and all that. Uh, just to give you an idea of the traditionalism uh, combined with the latest in theology and even liberation theology. So I had a very ideal introduction to serious, you know, religious life because, as I said, the whole leadership, all the people there, most of them in charge of our formation pretty much, had been formed themselves in the leading centers of the Catholic Church. I mentioned Les Sorchois, this French school that probably provided more experts to Vatican Council II than any other single place. The other one probably being uh, Fourvier Lyon, or Lyon Fourvier, where the Jesuits had their place uh, also in France. But um, we had this very, you know, Vatican II spirituality. The novitiate consisted largely on uh, the expounding, the explaining of the Vatican II documents by the novice master or commenting on them. He was not a, a theologian, but he had a serious Spanish Dominican theological formation. But the actual forms of the life were very traditional. We had the choir, we ate in silence, someone read while we ate, unless a special guest appeared and then they would, you know, uh, hit the glass with a spoon and make a clinking noise. And then silence would be suspended so that the guest could talk, we could listen to the guest, etc. Maybe for a festive occasion sometimes. We had the choir with two sides and a cantor and all that. And we, of course, wore the habit. And uh, as a real typical sort of thing, our provincial, which I, whom I mentioned, Father Desobri, Agustin Desobri, um, who had been the prior of Yves Congar and all these great theologians who knew Pope Paul VI and he knew the president or the future president of Mexico anyway who built the highway to the novitiate and 
maybe even put up some phone uh, or um, electric lines and all that kind of stuff. When he came to visit the provincial of the province of uh, Santiago de Mexico, St. James of Mexico, founded in the 16th century, re revived, I think, around 1960, you, you, you uh, got on your knees to speak to him. Um, and, and that's the kind of tradition that this Dominican order had. So it was a very beautiful... Um, you know, introduction to religious life and, and theologically, of course, it was very interesting and very good. And I left, as I said, my parents died and I have come to regret that, although it may have been impossible anyway. I don't want to belabor that anymore. I went off into the law as a sort of way of adapting to the kind of social circles I came from, the friends that I had, I had little guidance. I uh, grudgingly studied law and practiced law. And then um, I tried with the, the Scoused Carmelites in the Dominican Republic, I think I spoke of that before, um, very rough. Um, hot and uh, but I studied quite a bit and they sent me to Spain where they put me really on probation they had serious doubts about my vocations uh, very serious problems with the fact that I already had been trained as a Dominican so even though the Carmelites were also a mendicant order, the same kind of semi-monastic, active life, contemplative life combination order. Their spirituality was very, very different. And they were very centered on uh, mystical theology or spiritual theology. The Dominicans could, could cover everything. Very few Carmelites really had that breath. And, um, and there you learn about St. John of the Cross's nothings, las nadas. So they really were a little bit neglectful in many ways. Uh, even St. John of the Cross, I think, says, don't really try to remember certain things. If they're important enough, they will come to your mind, etc. So it's a very sort of a laissez-faire or kind of laid-back approach. I may have mentioned, I think I probably did, that the novitiate in the Dominican Republic was constructed without any supervision by the leaders of the... It wasn't a province, it was a delegation, they call it, which depended on the province of Castile in Spain. Very, you know, ancient you know, Dominican, or at least, you know, 16th century this Scoused Carmelite province. And so, of course, if you don't supervise the construction of a building, uh, you know, when the mouse, when the cat is away, the mice will play. Uh, they used very bad materials and they did a very poor, shoddy job and just no one really cared. And so I, that wasn't, you know, exactly, I don't know, what they were looking for with me. I'm not that, that kind of person, I don't think. So in any case, I left that, came back to the law, and this is what I wanted to, to start speaking about a little bit. And I'll, I don't think I'll go as long as I've gone with, these, with this series, but maybe, maybe I will. I, I can't predict exactly. A dear friend of mine, this is how things happen at a certain point in life. So I was already 43. 243 years old. I was very tense practicing law. I didn't like it. And a friend of mine, a dear, brilliant, a beautiful friend of mine, who would visit me per periodically, uh, a woman a little younger than me, showed up uh, as my guest in my place in Key Biscayne, uh, Florida island off Miami in case people don't know and she uh, 
I showed her for some reason the notebooks that I had done uh, translating from the Greek uh, into Spanish, the New Testament, and the Dominican Republic, and then some of the Hebrew I did in Spain. And she goes, this is your passion. Why don't you go to Rome? And so this became a, a very interesting moment of spiritual discernment, and I wanted to speak a little bit about that. So here I am, early 40s. I'm a lawyer. I don't like it. Thank God I have no family to support. So I was able to be free to pursue new opportunities that would be probably very irresponsible for a married person to do. And so I liked the idea. It sounded like a dream and in fact my best friend said to me, it was probably one of the very first to support me in that decision or desire because you can't call it a decision yet I had no clue about the logistics of going to Rome to study. So he said to me, go for it. Few people get to live their dream. And the dream of living in Rome studying theology was a dream. I had probably saved close to 30 or $25,000 and I had no clear idea of how long that would last. I had no idea about anything in Rome except that um, this friend of mine, Fiorella is her name, said to me, um, you know, go and, 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 and you'll, I'll try to find you house, help you find housing, etc. So I started, I asked my pastor, and he said, go ahead, sounds like a good idea. I asked some other people. I had dinner one time with a, a couple that were very nice people, and he said to me, I wanted to be a sports TV producer. It sounded like a dream. I had just come from Venezuela. And I would sit in that sofa right there crying, but I was determined to pursue that dream. And the, he asked me, what do you really want to do in life? And I said, if I could do anything I wanted to, I would study theology, hopefully, you know, teach it. Goes, well, do it. And I'm sitting in my, my law office at this really miserable place that ironically was like the fulfillment of an early dream that was not a good dream to have. When I thought of being a lawyer, I thought of, you know, the prestige of having an office in a, in a building in a high floor with a view, etc. And eventually I wound up in just such a place in downtown Miami in front of the courthouse but when I would open you know the elevator doors would open and I would walk into this office to me it was like walking into a tomb it was the most miserable place now that last job or yeah basically the last full-time job I had in the law was very, very iffy. The guy hired me very, very much on probation, etc. And, um, you know, so the whole atmosphere, not only in general, but with me in particular, was dismal, gloomy. So th this friend of mine, Virella, arrived at just the right time. I think it was the Feast of the Assumption of Mary, August 15. 1996 and I asked uh, and when, so when I told and, and in that very office an old friend of mine who had studied law himself from Key Biscayne said to me I said to him you know I admire you I envy you because you studied law like I did but you pursue other things that are not the practice of law 
and I wish I had, you know, the ability to do that, etc. And he goes, well, it's a question of possibility thinking, or it's a question of, you know, expanding your horizons, or going for it, or doing what you really want to do, or, or something to that effect, which was like another third confirmation of, of you know, encouraging me to pursue this, this desire. So I book my flight to Rome to look for housing and to, uh, you know, get admitted into the university, which was the least of my concerns. That was easy. I went to a wedding, a wonderful wedding in Toledo, Spain. I had spent time in Toledo, as I said before, uh, with the Carmelites on weekends especially and holidays and so I was invited to a wedding I went to the wedding uh, as a stop on to Rome went to Madrid um, talked to my professor friend there um, librarian professor Bible scholar may he rest in peace I, and and um, he said to me, well, you, we're going to be in Rome ourselves, my, my, myself and this colleague of mine for this biblical Italian Biblical Congress, so we'll run into each other. And so uh, that was good. And so I arrive in, in, in Rome. Uh, the married couple took me to the airport. Uh, they were on their way to their honey, honeymoon. Had a wonderful dinner uh, with a whole bunch of people at this Toledo restaurant, which the food there is to die for. And at two or three in the morning, we went to the airport, and I got my flight to Rome. Arrived in Rome. I, I had been uh, in Rome in '89, and also in night in '81. So I. Um, had a place to stay with the nuns, as I always did. And I went to the Gregorian and met with the Dean of Theology, Father, Father Jared Wicks, Jesuit, was admitted immediately. I mean, I had credentials and I had, you know, school records and all that college degree, law degree, theological studies at Weston Jesuit School of Theology and at Harvard. And so he said to me, you know, the requirement is that you take a month of Italian. You can enroll after two weeks. So if you enroll now, I mean, you can, enroll, uh, you can, after two weeks of the Italian, you can, you know, take classes here. And so if you take the Italian course now, it'll be two weeks before the semester starts and then you have another two weeks of Italian and then you're done with that requirement and you also have to verify your previous studies via an oral and a, and a written exam of your theological knowledge because I had no degree in theology but I was uh, as, you know, uh, getting a license in theology, which is like a master's or even even more, and so I needed to uh, make up for the lack of theology degree, like a bachelor's in theology or some other kind of theology degree. Even an MDiv here and masters of the a master of divinity is is a requisite for this license. And so I was in, now the, the, the problem began finding housing. And I was trying to be as resourceful, resourceful as possible. I didn't know much Italian. You could do little or nothing over the phone. Even if you knew Italian, you still had to go places to ask and see. And I did, and I knocked on doors galore. And there was absolutely no chance. I found a place really far out. And when I was kind of happy that maybe this was the place, the guy uh, tells me that I also have to have the other room and get a roommate if I can't afford it. 
So all of a sudden everything changed. I called somebody up. He didn't want to live that far out. So I really went through hell. And the persons that uh, my friend Fiorella had recommended and had maybe even contacted to help me were no help at all. I ended up um, meeting the ex-general of the Sulpicians, venerable order in the church. And he was nice enough to go through the Gregorian catalog with me where in all the religious houses, colleges they call them, were listed with phone numbers. And he started checking all the ones that he thought might be open to a layperson lodging with them, paying his, his rent or, or room and board, if that's what it was. And, and all these houses are huge houses in Rome. These are tend, tend to be the general houses of all the religious orders and congregations. But it was prohibited, basically, and certainly not their custom, to allow a layperson, not a seminarian or a priest, to lodge there. Even the Marinos, the most liberal, progressive of the orders, the brother, I guess, who answered the phone expressed shock. We were, I was talking to him in English. He, he, he goes, you want to live here? Like, like you know, saying preposterous for a layperson studying theology to live in a huge, I could have been in the East Wing or whatever, you know, but, it, you know, almost uh, unseen in a way. But so that didn't happen. And I had some close calls where I thought maybe, and then all of a sudden, no. I had some humiliations that I, I don't want to get into. In fact, with the Dominicans, I was wearing this Costa Rican shirt with all these little caric you know, cartoons or something on it. And I knocked on this Dominican door. I'm not going to give more details than that. Uh, that I, somebody had told me maybe there and I was going everywhere they said maybe there look there and this friar comes out with a couple of older lady companions obviously having had a wonderful lunch it looked like to me and uh, I said I, I, I want, I'm interested in lodging here if it's possible he goes no there's nothing here and to live in Rome it's very expensive and he looks at my Costa Rican shirt, this is a Spaniard, and says to me, and you need a lot more than beans to afford living here. <laughs> so you kick a, you kick a dog when, when they're down, I guess. Now, this friend of mine, priest, librarian, Bible scholar, who was attending the Biblical Congress in Rome, very interesting. So he runs into this, this Opus Dei priest. They invite me over to a place that to me was like a paradise. And I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. Little did I imagine, not only that I would study in Rome and obtain my goal in Rome, but return to Rome in triumph, so to speak, years later, 2011, and stay in that very same palatial place that I met with these priests who were trying to help me find housing. And the view that you see here is from my room. I have a lot of other... Uh, pictures of rooms from my views from my room this is my my actual little my little room in this place in 2011 this is not I'm jumping ahead years okay but what happened uh, when I went to see these priests the the librarian from Spain was a gentle soul a little naive the Opus Dei guy was a little bit more uh, you know shifty or something so 
he starts making phone calls. The Opus Dei guy starts making, and they have a lot of properties and things like that. They start making phone calls on my behalf for uh, living uh, there in Rome, lodging. And at one point, he says, okay, I think I have a place for you. And the naive librarian priest says, so we, we can, in Spanish, we can sing victory, problem solved. It sounded like a great opportunity. And, uh, and he goes, and we have an invitation to the Biblicum, the Pontifical Biblical Institute for dinner on the occasion of this uh, Biblical Congress that's taking place there. And you and we'll invite you. Okay, great. So he goes, we'll meet. I think the Opus Dei priest says to me, we'll meet in the Gregorian steps. I think it was a Wednesday evening to confirm your lodging and to go to this dinner. So a few days pass. I show up eagerly at the steps of the Gregorian, thinking I'm going to rejoice at having lodging in Rome, <laughs> and then a beautiful dinner with incredible Bible scholars that I would be in awe of. And finally, the Opus Dei priest shows up alone and says to me, I'm sorry, the uh, place that I thought you could lodge in fell through, and I'm sorry I gotta go have a dinner to go to, <laughs> which was the dinner I was supposed to be going to, but he kind of, oh my God. So I remember walking away from the Gregorian back to the nuns, and I noticed the street I am on, and it's called Via de l'Humilta, Humility Way. And I went through a lot of suffering those 10, 12 days. I prolonged my stay looking for housing and I came back very dejected. And um, I came back to, to visit a friend of mine, a, a Jamaican American friend of mine who had a friend with him, very interesting fellow, Tom, I think his name was. I, I was very dejected. I explained my predicament. I have this tremendous desire to go to Rome. I've been accepted at the university, but I have no way to lodge there. Impossible, almost. People that I thought would help me did not. And so this man, this uh, friend of my, my other friend, takes out a little photocopy of... Um, a virgin that um, is um, called Our Lady of the Street. And um, I'm going to show you a picture of her that I took myself. And um, I see this uh, image and I read in Italian that it says Madonna della Strada, which I knew meant that Our Lady of the Street or Our Lady of the Way. And I said, I'm going to pray to her because I, I, find, I have a feeling I'm going to wind up on the street. And to continue the story along a little faster, a Dominican friend of mine from the Mexico days, who was a professor of canon law at the Angelicum University of the Dominicans in Rome, who had always favored my staying in the law. He said theology is a hobby, stay in the law. This time when I called him in Mexico from Miami, he said to me, if you have been accepted at the Gregorian and your only problem is lodging don't worry that will be taken care of 
And I took that as a very unusual further encouragement, confirmation that God was calling me to this despite all the hardships and obstacles on the path. And I proceeded to, I call it, dismantle my, my life. I had a leased car, a Toyota. A friend of mine took it over. I paid the transfer fees for assuming the lease. I remained on the hook, but this was a reliable person. I got rid of my desktop and bought a little laptop. This is 96. I mean, this was not super sophisticated stuff but nevertheless I brought I bought a portable printer that you could you know easily travel with in those days you could carry a whole duffel bag of books which I did on an airplane without any problem or extra luggage or anything and uh, I was all set to go I had my ticket I didn't know where I was going to stay I spoke to Fiorella she said to me you may have to be two weeks with some nuns and then move another two weeks with some other nuns because those nuns have limits, according to their confederation or whatever, that guests can only stay for two weeks. You can't have a permanent lodger. So I'm there waiting, and I call my friend in Mexico, the Dominican, who's back in Rome, uh, to resume the semester as a professor, again, of canon law. And he goes, I think I found a place for you. In the Angelicum University bulletin board, uh, literal bulletin board, someone had advertised for a room in Monteverde Vecchio, which is a beautiful area of Rome, where uh, you know the park is. Here you can see, um, you know, kind of like the area I'm talking about, the Garibaldi statue, that man on horseback there is Garibaldi. This is in the Gianicolo, which is the hill that Monte Verde Vecchio is uh, situated in, one of the famous seven hills of Rome. And so that I, I arrive in Rome... He had a place for me with nuns for a, a night or two, but it wouldn't take longer than that, apparently. We spoke. I went to his office in the Angelicum, which I would visit then many, many, many times over my stay there. We're very good friends to this day. He's back in Mexico. He's old. And he calls these people in Brescia, in the north of Italy. This is a man and a woman, well off, liquor manufacturers the woman's brother had been a bachelor had died and had bequeathed willed this apartment to her and it was a three-bedroom apartment i think had a kitchen had a little room nobody ever used maybe they the, the, the owners would use it two free bedrooms and then some other room that i think was a living room converted into a a bigger room for a man studying canon law who had already finished civil law, a man from Sardinia, who lived there for free, sort of as a caretaker of this place. And these owners had had a bad experience with youth that had rented the place and had made a mess and didn't pay bills or whatever. So they had decided that it was better to rent at a low price to a responsible person, such as myself, rather than try to get as much money as possible, which they didn't need, and rent to irresponsible people. So I went there that very evening, talked to the porter lady, uh, who I would have dealings with. I lived there for, I ended up living there for over, for two years. Um, this lady showed me the two rooms that were available. I only needed to rent one. I chose the smaller, prettier one, cheaper, and the other one remained free. Later on, some, some German exchange guy or something, student, occupied it. But I had found 
the ideal living place. Cheap, we call it in Spanish, bueno, bonito y barato, you know, good, pretty, and cheap. Can't ask for more than that. I would take the bus in the morning. Uh, when it ran in that street later, it didn't quite run that very street. I had to walk to another bus stop. And um, I would go shopping at the grocery store, which is a very interesting experience in, in Rome, in Italy. Buy all these incredible things that prosciutto would not be sli sliced. You would get, you know, a chunk of it, I guess, uh, and other stuff, porchetta and wine in, in cartons. And uh, my, my housemate would cook, and I would wash the dishes, but most of the time he would say, save it for later. <laughs> Italian uh, laissez-faire. And so my dream uh, came, came true, or at least, I, yes, I went to Rome and I was studying theology, and I could afford it probably two years, which it would take to do the license. I already had advanced credits and everything, so I could, if I really focused, and I did. I mean, I had no TV for two years. My bed was a fold-out bed with a very thin mattress. The bathroom had a, a, a bathtub with a shower, uh, detachable shower head that I don't think you could even fix anywhere. You had to hold it in one hand and there was no shower curtain and no way to install one. So that if it was cold, you, you thought about it twice before going into the tub without a shower curtain to, to shower. So um, it was a different lifestyle. Um, and so I, I was there, and uh, what I wanted to say was that I started making my rounds. I would go on walks on Saturdays or Sundays or whatever, and then I, w I went to the Church of Jesu, which is the main Jesuit church in the world, uh, uh, with the Jesuit residents next to it. A lot of professors live there, etc., and I went there, and it had to have been the 24th of May, which I, I've checked this, but I'm going, I'm going to go with this without double-checking it right now. 1997, 24th of May was a Saturday. And um, the 24th of May is the feast of Our Lady of the Streets, unbeknownst to me. So I'm looking at a calendar, and the 24th of May was a Friday. Oh, but I'm looking at 96, and it should be 97. So um, in 1997, the 24th of May was indeed a Saturday. So I wander into this church, and it's packed with people. Now, I don't know anything about the church except that it's the Jesuit church, and it's pretty, and I know a couple of things about the art, but no more. It's packed with people, a lot of men. And I ask what's going on? And they said, it is the feast of the patroness of the street cleaners and the taxi drivers. La Madonna de la Estrada. And I said, this is the virgin they gave me the photocopy of when I thought I was going to be out on the street. And they said, and her chapel is there to the left, as there's another chapel of the Sacred Heart to the right by the same architect. I've read all about that now. 
So after this mass for their patroness that I serendipitously stumbled upon on that day of all days, I made my way to the chapel and I saw, I don't think it was this very image. This is the restored image to the original look the one that I was still looking at in those days, over 20 years ago, had a crown and some other added stuff that, good intention, but destroyed the art. This is an image that goes back before St. Ignatius. There's some talk about where the name comes from, and it may come from the name of the street not necessarily Strada, but Stalla or Stalle or something. Uh, it's, it's a very venerable Roman virgin, Greek looking and, and a wonderful, my favorite image of the virgin basically. And, and, and so she had uh, helped me stay off the street and find a, 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 a home, really, a place to stay. So that was quite a finale, if you will. Not that I didn't suffer plenty at the Gregorian with some professors and with some of the expectations I had or, or, or attitudes or many other things, but I, I did thrive very well the same Father Wicks uh, sort of finagled it to get me elected student representative from theology and then later senator, student senator, at, to, to, able to sit at certain meetings of the faculty. So I had a wonderful experience at the Greg and um, to con just finish my story of Rome, I uh, then was almost out of money and I needed to get the doctorate. And the two plays that I was considering, the Gregorian and the Angelicum, the Angelicum would have been easier and faster and I didn't have a lot of time to, to spend studying at the age of 46 or something. Um, they both had dropped out of the student loan, U.S. student loan program. So I got a meeting with the rector of the Gregorian, Sardinian priest, I forget his name now. Uh, and he was convinced by me that lay people such as myself depended on these loans, that the religious could study without having to worry about that. So he says, I'll put a man on this to get us back in there. Meanwhile, at the Angelicum, I go over there and they said, a nun, a sister was working on this, but she took off. We're not even sure where her papers are. I said, because I'll do the work myself of getting you, you guys eligible for the student loan program. And they actually got a hold of this nun, sister when she's on her way to the airport back to America, they asked her, where are the papers that you were working on to get the Angelicum back into the U.S. student loan program? And she goes, oh, that drawer somewhere. They find them. I take them with me back to Miami for the summer. And I spent the summer of 98, we're now in 1998, I had gotten my license from the Gregorian, Magna Cum Laude. And I spent the summer at my good friend's office making phone calls a lot to Washington and Tallahassee, Florida, etc. And I was able to get the Angelicum temporarily or approved on a temporary basis for the U.S. student loan program. And guess who the first guy to get a student loan was me. And since, since there was no financial aid office, they gave me $14,000. Give you an idea. Um, lump sum. 
which I put in a CD. And that was enough for me to pay tuition, which was about $700 or $800 a year. My lodging, I moved from the Monteverde address to the Angelicum Convito San Tomaso, which is the Dominican college place that originally I probably could have tried there, but I thought it might, it might be too expensive. Now at 700 some dollars a month, room and board, beautiful location and everything, atmosphere. You had meals with great people, priests and, and others from all over the world and always, you know, cheap but very drinkable wine, etc. And sometimes the meals were good, very good, and, you know, parties and things like that. Um, I could afford this whole thing with $14,000 for the year. And I cranked out my dissertation with a lot of some tribulation in one year, finished it, handed it in, not without, again, difficulties in having somebody wanting to keep it, etc. And uh, came back to Miami in 1999 after a trip to Israel and got a job part-time at the seminary and at University of Miami and I actually was eligible to get another student loan uh, for the following year which thankfully I only needed a, a, a portion of it so that I paid back the rest of that and then the rest of everything because I got my full-time job in the year 2000 at the seminary where I remained for another 13 years total of 14 if you count the part-time year so that's the story that's a story a real story true story of how I uh, had all these bumps, trying to study to be a priest, perhaps making wrong decisions or uninformed or immature, mistaken decisions, who knows, continued along, was inspired by a muse friend got to live my dream and not only live it but relive it because I, I then returned to Rome every year twice a year for, for years I've taken probably close to 30 trips to to Rome and so I have savored all this over and over and over now with COVID I'm ready not to go back for for a while or if, if, if ever I enjoyed it. Have a lot of pictures. Um, these are simply rooms from views from my room in 2011. That's jumping ahead 11 years, which I haven't done. Uh, you know, um, look at some of these views. This, this is all my my Western views from my my room. Um, which was a beautiful view except that and i want to finish with a little story that i was thinking about this morning facing west meant that as soon as it got a little hot which nowadays it began even back then in 2011 in april it was super hot but even before april i was there uh, sabbatical semester all february march april may in the afternoon, you had to have your window completely closed, uh, the shutters closed, because it was the sun was hitting you right, right, intensely. And at night, you know, one, two in the morning, whatever, three in the morning, the traffic and and the drunks, especially American, especially drunks, getting hailing taxis and all, and the taxi drivers yelling to each other, made sleep uh, not a an easy thing to do all night so everything comes with with a, a downside and I wanted to finish with something I was thinking about this morning about the nature of, of reality and the nature of things 
you know that all all I'm read I'm looking I'm reading about Jerry Garcia and the song Touch of Gray. Every sink, silver lining has a touch of gray, which is a very interesting thing to say. Most people say every cloud has a silver lining, but in this interesting song, Touch of Gray by Robert Hunter, every silver lining has a touch of gray. So I was thinking about an owl that I heard about and saw in one of these nature programs which I love and this owl is a special kind of owl I don't know if it's a white owl or some other kind of name for the owl whose feathers uh, don't have this lanolin or other types of protective covering that most uh, owls have and this this enables the owl to be a fantastic predator because this owl can fly without making any noise and glide and just hit upon its prey by surprise much better than any other predator of that kind. So you might say this could be the perfect predator owl, but no, there's a a touch of gray in, in that silver lining the lack of this lanolin or more greasy substance in the feathers that enables it to fly so silently and stealthily means that when it rains and it gets wet it can't fly at all and if it stays wet and it stays raining long enough it can starve to death so the very I was thinking about it in terms of sensitive people you know the very uh, trait quality ability characteristic that makes it so special in its praying is its potentially fatal flaw that um, what makes it such an effective flyer makes it vulnerable to rain potentially fatally so I wanted to finish on that note um, I think I what I tried to do is to speak about discernment of God's will and pursuing dreams that are of God amidst all those obstacles with some sort of uh, faith and trust and, and really validation from experience that um, God has good things in store for us. I remember a, spirit, a Jesuit spiritual director reading to me this famous passages, passage from Jeremiah, I think it's 29, um, you know, uh, you know, I have, you know, plans for you uh, of peace, thoughts of peace, not of disgrace to give you a future with hope. I will visit you and confirm over you my promise to make you return to this place. So I think that we can uh, trust God to guide us despite all the hardships of the cross. And I'll end on that note.